All right, go ahead and uh, turn to your Bibles in John chapter 11. Uh, we'll read about a guy named Lazarus who, who was resurrected from the dead. John chapter 11. We're going to start at verse 17. As you're flipping there, uh, my name's Greg. I am one of the pastors here, uh, and I welcome you to Midtown. Happy Easter. It's a great time of the year to get together as a church and to, to, look, at, to look at the gospel. Uh, man, um, we have, I have one desire, and I can speak for the other pastors here. We have a total of four pastors. We call them pastors because this church is shepherded by a group of men uh, that are led by the Lord. We have one desire, and that is that is to show to show you Jesus, to reveal Jesus to you as He's revealed to us from Genesis one, all the way to uh, Revelations twenty one, twenty two. Forget how many are there, but uh, I want you to see Jesus. It's not it's not our endeavor. It's not even a desire of ours to get you busy with church stuff to do church things. Uh, we we know something's much more important about you that we want you to hear this morning. That is uh, that God can bring new life to you if you have not already experienced it, and uh, that is my hope this morning. Let's go, John, chapter eleven, verse seventeen, all the way to verse uh, forty-four. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Verse 26, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Verse 27, she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, They followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying, Lord, if he had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Verse 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on the account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with the cloth. Jesus said to him, to them, unbind him and let him go. Uh, Father God, we come to uh, see your glory, uh, the glory that is revealed through your only Son, Jesus Christ, who, at the hands of man, 
died a horrible death upon a, upon a cross on a tree, became a curse to break the final enemy, death, which happened three days later when he, the source of life, rose from the grave. And Father, I know if I and if we feast on him, we too will have life uh, and life abundantly. And that this flesh, the flesh we live in, is corrupt and is of no good and has got to die. Uh, but God, I don't, I don't pray for the physical flesh. I pray for the spiritual man that we all have. Uh, maybe some in this room, that man has not been brought to life and in others it is alive. I ask that uh, this morning that you speak to that spiritual man, the spiritual life within us. Call those who are dead to life and call those who have found life closer to you through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, you know, uh, look, you're here, you probably know the Easter story and you know it's not found in John chapter 11. You know Lazarus is not really part of the Easter story. Uh, you know, what we do here and what I do when I preach is I walk through uh, the book of John, a verse at a time, chapter at a time, section at a time, story at a time. And uh, we land here, John chapter 11, Easter of 2016, and therefore I've determined that it was of God for me to preach about this because Jesus said something in that story that we have recorded in John that you have to know. You have to know this. He said in verse, I want to say 25, maybe 35, uh, Verse 25, Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Verse 26, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? We, we stop here. You know, did you know Lazarus was raised from the dead just maybe two weeks before Jesus himself was risen from the dead? Uh, we don't know exactly the timeline. But we do know Jesus is in his final approach to Jerusalem, lands two miles outside of Jerusalem, and it will be that Passover that comes up next, which is just a week or two away, where Jesus is led ultimately to the cross and dies. I find it interesting and compelling that Jesus chooses to raise Lazarus in, in, in God's preordained uh, timing he Lazarus comes up with this illness and dies shortly before Jesus dies. And Jesus waits four days to bring him back uh, from the dead. Uh, let's talk real quick. Actually, not real quick. Let's spend a, a bit of time on this statement. I am the resurrection and the life. You know, Mark uh, read from 1 Corinthians 15. And in 1 Corinthians 15, if you've got time today and you want to supplement your Easter reading, go home and read that chapter. Read about yourself. Read about what you will become and what you are. Because 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells the Corinthian church that the final enemy is death. It's not Satan. It's not the devil. It is death. And death was swallowed up in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How is that possible? How is the resurrection of Jesus even possible? It's all bound up in the statement, I am the resurrection and the life. I mean, we, we need to, I want you to understand this because it says a lot about yourself and it screams a lot about the man Jesus that some of you, if not all of you, know to be the son of God. Jesus says to Martha, Martha, I am the definite article, resurrection and the life. And I... I saw an editorial note in my Bible. That's why Paul's reading. I wanted to read it real quick. Uh, some manuscripts omit and the life, uh, meaning that there was some textual variance, you know, back in translating the Greek and looking at the old manuscripts that some had that latter phrase, the life, and some didn't. Uh, regardless, John 14, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, so if we add the life here as the ESV has it, uh, we are sticking true to who Jesus is. Jesus is. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He doesn't say a resurrection and a life. He doesn't say uh, resurrections happen through me and life happens through me. He says, definite article, I am the resurrection and the life. So you can call Jesus the resurrector, the life giver. You go way back to Genesis 1 and what happens? A pile of dust is formed into a man, and someone, God, breathed life into that man, into that pile of dust, and it became a living being, an image 
of God himself. That person who breathed life was Yahweh. Jesus' name is Yahweh saves. Yahweh on the earth. Yahweh, who we would call Jesus as his man form, breathed life into Adam. Jesus can say, I'm the resurrection and the life because he is, don't miss this, the source of life. Okay, and I say this and I hear inside of my, inside of myself, that doesn't resonate. What does it mean to be the source of life? Without Jesus, there is no life. Period. You see, back in the, in the, uh, in the garden, life was meant to be eternal for man. Life was meant to not be interrupted by death. But when man made a decision to make, to listen, Adam, to his wife over God, he made a decision to die. And his flesh did not die, but his spiritual man died. It was no longer connected to the source of life. And so he died in that very moment that he stopped listening to God. The source of life, Jesus, as we would call him in his man form, Yahweh, was pulled out. He was now left to live in the corruption of his flesh, which was doomed to die. And as Mark read, flesh cannot, mortal mortality cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The perishable has to become imperishable. This has to die for the spiritual life to come fully into life and for this to be redeemed. Jesus tells Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Life comes from me. Life comes from me. So we, we've been talking in John. Uh, John has shown us Nicodemus, a Samaritan woman. We, he, we've seen an official and a son. We've seen an invalid. John has brought characters into the picture to show us what it means to have new life. Nicodemus, for example, be born again, Nicodemus. And, uh, and John 6 if you go to John 6 and you go home and read it and you read that Jesus literally says you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood and you Google that, you will see people struggling with, well, are we cannibals? And what, what's going on is they don't understand a second person inside of you. The spiritual man. The flesh man and the spirit man. And I know that sounds kind of weird and for you, if you've been involved in teaching that has ushered you to a better physical life, then this will sound crazy to you. But Jesus was not concerned necessarily about saving the flesh as he was so much about saving the spiritual man. And so, and so we, uh, so Jesus says in John chapter 6, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And what is he talking about? Your spirit man, your spiritual life has to feast on Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The flesh has to die. And this is why here at Midtown, this is why I've chosen to not take a path to build better marriages or better finances or restore relationships. I've chosen a path to show you who you are, what you can become, and who your Savior really is. Yahweh, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Father. When he says, I am the resurrection and the life, we can now understand two weeks later, when he rises from the grave, Jesus made a decision upon the Father's will that, oh, it's time to get up because life is in me. Death does not conquer me. I conquer death. Nobody, no one needed to call him out of the grave because life was bound up inside of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He will rise one day. And if you realize who's standing right in front of you, you could call upon the name of the Lord, and he may very well rise right now in front of you. Guys, I want you to understand this. You have two beings, your fleshly being and your spiritual being. And the question is, is your spiritual being alive or dead? And if it's dead this morning, then I pray to God that he sends his spirit to awaken it and bring it alive inside of you so you can understand what is being said. And if it's alive, I pray that it is strengthened as we feast on what Jesus did just a couple weeks, as he proved, a couple weeks before his resurrection, as he proved who he was. 
I am the resurrection. Let me prove it to you because in two weeks, you're going to see something you're going to have no explanation for. So we go to the story of Lazarus, chapter 17, and we're just going to, we're going to bounce through it. Uh, and I know it's a lot of verses to cover, but uh, you will be, I believe you will be enlightened. Now, verse 17, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. John wants you to know that Jesus is near Jerusalem. He's, he's just a couple miles outside of Jerusalem. He's approaching his final days. And we'll see, half of John is devoted to the last week of Jesus' life. Verse 19, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Just a a question I want to ask, why is Martha always presented as on her feet, and Mary is always, except one instance that I found, presented on, uh, on her tush on the ground? I really don't have a good answer, but I will toss this out to you. When you view a Christian, what do you view? For a long time, I viewed a person who was kind of chiseled on the outside to be someone who was, if we pull the disc personality, you know, out with the C. A contemplative, mellow, slow to act, you know, I'm going to pray about everything kind of person. This is like Mary. I see Mary as the C on the disc personality test and Martha as the D. And I think John, I'm just saying, I think John is showing us two women of the same family, completely different personalities to show you that God's not here to change personalities. He's here to bring new life to who he already created. That you were designed unique and you were designed for a purpose. And it is to our shame to preachers who try to shape your flesh to be something more tolerable and acceptable when they miss the whole spiritual being inside of you. That that God created Martha to be Martha and Mary to be Mary and you to be you. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I'll just make note of it. Mary says the exact same thing to Jesus. But Martha adds on. Uh, but Martha says, but even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Now, Martha reveals something about herself when she says this. The word ask, there's two Greek words in, in the New Testament for ask. One means someone asking something, a, an inferior asking a superior for something. And the other Greek word is people of the same dignity, equal dignity, you know, asking each other for something. Martha uses the one that, uh, the, the word ask that refers to an inferior speaking to a superior. In other words, she views Jesus as a man sent from God, as a prophet, a very good teacher, someone of God, but not God yet. And this is, te- this is important to know because of Jesus' response to her. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Now he's using words that is going to trigger a conversation in her as we see this oftentimes in John. That Jesus wants to have a conversation with her to talk about this lack of understanding who he is. Martha said to him, verse 24, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So Martha shows us that she's been trained by Jews, probably out at the synagogue, if not even the temple, uh, because the Pharisees believed in a resurrection in the last day. She has a decent understanding of Scripture and uh, the doctrines of, of the resurrection in the last days. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Let's just talk about this believing, because he says, 
though you die, if you believe, though you die, yet shall you live. But everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Let's just talk about this for a minute. I believe this first statement is directly talking about Lazarus, but applies to us. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. I bet you Lazarus knew who Jesus was. And he's going to be a picture of what's to come for you. I bet you, and this is uh, it's just, just my opinion, he knew Jesus was the Son of God. And Jesus is kind of saying in a way to Martha, he believed in me. And though he died, he's going to live. But for you this morning, you have to die. Unless God chooses to send his son back and call you back, your flesh has got to die. But though you die, you live. And Jesus goes the next step and explains this even a little bit more because our view of death is not Jesus' view of death. Jesus says in the next statement, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Guys, life is not bound up in your flesh. It's not. This has got to go away. This has got to go. And I, and I urge you to not spend more effort in saving this than saving what's going on in here. Jesus is saying, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Meaning, guys, the, the death of the flesh is not death to Jesus. Death is not knowing Jesus. Death is being separated from God. Death is not knowing Yahweh. It's not having the source of life in you. And if you live, you never die. And the death that happens in the flesh, as Paul refers to it, and as Jesus referred to it for Lazarus earlier, just resting in peace. Don't don't fear death. If you know Jesus, don't, don't, you have no need to fear death. Do you believe this? It's the question he poses to Martha, but that's the question I have to pose to you this morning. Do you believe Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Martha understood a little bit more who Jesus was in that that moment. And she makes that declaration. But we're going to see. She hesitates to commit. Verse 28, And when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, Mary heard it. She rose quickly. I'm telling you, every time Mary comes in the picture, she's on the ground. And now, when well, she rose quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the village. And I only bring that up because I don't really know what to do with it, but John tells us every time what Mary's doing. She's on the ground. Three times, she's at the feet of Jesus. The other times, she's just chilling. I have a feeling John's telling us for a reason. I, I honestly haven't figured out that reason. Now, if you figure it out, shoot me an email. Because I would love to know. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. That word weep means to wail. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Same same declaration. This is where I don't think you can say, well, Mary being the one at Jesus' feet, the one listening to Jesus is any better than Martha. We can't, you know, I think we become dangerous when we start comparing the two sisters. I would ask yourself then, do you compare yourself to other Christians and dictate are you a Christian based upon how well you look compared to the person next to you? Just don't do it because it's, it's of no value to you. When Jesus 
saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. All right, so these Jews, probably some of them were friends and some of them were hired uh, mourners as they had back in the day. They follow Mary around and they console her by weeping with her. Uh, this is just a freebie. What do you do when you have someone in your life that's close to you experiencing death or someone that they love recently died? Uh, it's not the time to try to explain death and ex- try to explain the doctrines of God. The best thing to do is sit there. Let them go through their emotions as they go through them. Because as, as people mourn, especially something like death, the emotional roller coaster is a wild ride of from shock to depression to anger to uh, to mourning, and they go through this cycle and you know, over and over again. And um, oftentimes they will have lots of questions that they're not looking for answers to, like why God, why me, why us, why this, that you really don't have answers to outside of sitting there, listening, and mourning with them as a filter, as God brings all the grief and the sorrow of death, the enemy of death to the surface in their life and they begin to deal with, maybe for the first time, life as it really is in the flesh. No good. It's got to die. And it brings about questions. I, I, I just, my encouragement, pastor, to you, sit there, mourn with them, be angry with them grieve with them, enter into their emotions. And when they sit down and say, I have a question for you, can you explain? Then talk with them. I personally, I've entered those situations and I don't know what to do and I'll open my mouth and it's the absolute last thing I should be doing. So I, I take I take a piece of advice from these professional mourners. They just followed the lady around and cried with her. Jesus said, well, okay, so what, look what happened to Jesus. He sees her weeping and these Jews weeping, and he's deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. The uh, the Greek, the, uh, I'm deeply moved and greatly troubled, you put it together, literally means to snort like a horse. I am not joking, okay? Because when I, th- when I see Jesus, as just a, another two verses later, he weeps. I'm thinking he sees Mary weeping, he sees the Jews weeping, and he's deeply moved to weep because they're weeping. This is not the case. Okay, deeply moved and greatly troubled. Greatly troubled means perturbed, frustrated, angry. Jesus is looking and seeing something that is causing agitation in him. Deep, deep agitation. I've read so many interpretations on this this week. I'm going to give you two. Uh, The second one is what I believe. I'll give you the first one because I had... I give some weight to it. The first interpretation as to what is Jesus angry about? Why is he deeply agitated at seeing them wail and seeing Mary weep? Uh, uh, first interpretation is this, and just do with it what you want, that Jesus is agitated that they don't see him as the Son of God, that he has the ability to raise Lazarus from the dead. Why don't they stop their weeping and go to the Son of God, the Resurrector and the life, and ask for their brother back? And, you know, this sort of fits the Gospel of John. John wants you to know Jesus Christ is God. He is the Son of God, walking on earth, gave his life, and came back. He wants you to believe in this. And so that seems to fit that interpretation, that Jesus is deeply agitated that they don't see him for who he really is. I bought into that, but then I I, I abandoned that because I read the story again. It just doesn't seem to fit. Um, Let me read to you something I found this week on the Jews' view of death. Uh, The general belief was that, uh, this is by some guy named Borchert. Do what you want with that. The general belief was that the spirit of the deceased hovered around the body for three days in anticipation of some possible means of re-entry into the body. But on the third day, it was believed that the body lost its color and the spirit was locked out. Therefore, the spirit was obliged to enter the chambers of Sheol, the place of the dead. The passing of the third day, therefore, signaled the conclusion of the last modicum of hope for the mourners. This could explain why the fourth day, there's a lot more, there just seems to be a lot of mourning going on as all hope 
has fade away. So I don't believe Jesus was angry at them uh, because, I mean, the dude's been dead four days. Why would you be angry at people mourning the death of their brothers and friends? I believe this is what I believe uh, is going on here. Jesus, the source of life, he possibly has never faced death like this, being a human being. In, in his human, he possibly has never faced death in this deep of sense. Uh, I mean, you've seen dead, you know, death. I mean, he's raised people from the dead, but so and so close to him, his friends weeping, that for the fir- maybe for the first time in his fleshly form, he's staring at the uh, the epitome of corruption, the the final enemy, death. And he knows he's the answer to it, but he's so agitated that there's death to begin with. You know, I experienced it uh, this week as someone was talking to me about some, um, they were experiencing death in their family. And as I was hearing their tears and their frustration, I became agitated deep down inside. I knew there was nothing I could do, but there was something inside of me that's saying, this, I mean, this is not the way it's supposed to be. This is not what God designed. And I think this is what Jesus was feeling, deeply moved in his spirit. This is not the original design of my beloved creation. And he's facing it head on. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see, verse 35. Jesus wept. It just it shows his humanity, that he was formed in our likeness. So the Jews said, see how he loved them. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? It's a good question. Great question to ask. Verse 38, then Jesus deeply moved again. As he's approaching the tomb, he is moved again in his spirit, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, because Mary's probably sitting on the ground somewhere, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Without being too descriptive, I do want you to know what was in that grave. Parents, you might be busy later on. Day three, coming to day four, depending on the humidity and the temperature. Well, hold on, let me back up. I, I read somewhere there's 30 trillion cells in your body. Someone spent a lot of lunch times counting, I guess. Give or take 10 trillion, there's a whole lot of cells inside of you. And then they decided to count the bacteria cells, 37 trillion bacteria cells inside of you. A lot of them in your digestive tracts as they're designed to eat and digest the things you consume. Uh, depending on the temperature, humidity, of course, the body immediately, uh, the bacteria cells no longer operate in the manner in which they were designed, and they begin to eat the body inside out. The pancreas, uh, for example, will be gone in three days. Uh, the body around day three into day four begins to blow and turn yellow. Large blisters form as the gas from the body breakdown begins to build. You touch the body and the blisters could fall off. Uh, fluid begins to come out of the, ho- of the holes in the face. I want to give you, an, when, Mary said, when Martha said it's going to smell, she's saying, hey, he's turning back to dust. He's done. He's dead, Jesus. There's no hope. What, what can you do, Jesus. Jesus said to her, Martha, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Guys, if you believe, if you believe, you will see the glory of God and you will experience it yourself one day. Because what happens to Lazarus here in a few verses will also happen to you. If you have been cremated and your dust spread across the entire world, your ears will still be able to hear the cry of the Son of God call you from the dead back to life. D- 
Do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe this, Midtown? Church, do you believe this? Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And what is the glory of God? We go back. I want to, the, the purpose of this, uh, Verse 4, chapter 11. The illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. What is the glory of God that Jesus Christ is presented to you for who he really is and you believe? You believe in that. So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up. So they took away the stone, guys. Put yourself there. The grave, the cave is open. Jesus is standing in front of it. His disciples possibly standing on one side, the Jews, the mourning Jews on another side, Mary and Martha maybe holding each other, and Jesus stands in front of a smelling corpse. What is he going to do? The disciples will see this and remember this till the day they die. Mary and Martha will see this and remember this until the day they die. And the Jews will see it and remember. What will he do? I mean, just imagine what would go on in your head. As you know this guy, he has done some crazy stuff in the past, but what will you do? I bet you someone in that crowd was starting to think, you got to be kidding me. He's going to come back to life. And others are probably in their religious staunch saying, how dare he become unclean by getting that close to a dead body? Roll away the stone. There he's standing before the grave, before the cave. Jesus starts talking to his father. I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on the account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. How cool would that be that if you could truly pray that, that you know, you know God always hears you. That your prayer life doesn't become something that is confined to five minutes on your knees up against the couch at 5.30 in the morning, but that God hears you all the time as a child of God. But Jesus says, I'm only saying this so that they can believe that you sent me. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And I I bet you with every ounce of energy that his human body had, he screamed those words to show the authority he had as the source of life, the resurrector, and the life. The man who died came out. Now his disciples can begin to understand that when Jesus was going to rise from the dead, how he did it. They begin to now be able to explain Easter to their kids. They have a, they, they will be sent out into the entire world with the message of the gospel, now have an explanation. He was God. He was the source of life. You exist because of him. That's why I believe Jesus did this just a couple weeks before his own resurrection. The man who had died came out, his hand and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, what what a great way to close this story out. Unbind him and let him go. Because that is my desire that you will be unbound from sin, from the corruption of your flesh, and let go from the fear of death. As Lazarus walks out in his grave clothes, he walks out just seconds before his muscles were broken down. His organs, just falling apart, walks out. Unbind him and let him go. Beautiful picture of the last days when God calls you from your grave. Now one question, do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? The flesh man and the spirit man. Maybe this morning, the spirit man is dead. I call for God to bring it to life this morning. But for all of you, the flesh man has got to go so that it can rise again. And you can be 
as you were designed to be, created in the image of God, flesh and bone, to live eternally with God the Father through his Son, Jesus Christ. Me and Gene will be up here to pray with you. If you want to talk to me about knowing Jesus, I'm here. You don't have to talk to me, though. I'm, I am so willing to talk to you, but just to let you know, you and God, this happens between you two. And you know something? It may simply be just a recon recognizing of what God's already done in your heart. That he's already called you to life.